So uh, my name is Sam Marshall. I'm the, the owner and managing director of Clearbox. Uh, if you don't quite know who we are, then we're based in the UK and now also in Ireland. So we've got that EU footprint and we specialize in the strategy and business side of digital workplaces. Just to reassure you, we are vendor neutral. We don't sell any software or sell any implementation services. And one of the things that that allows us to do is to work with organizations, everything from small charities up to, to multinational organizations to help them plan a roadmap for the now often Office 365 based intranets and digital workplaces. So hopefully you know us because we do this annual report called SharePoint Intranets in a Box. Uh, we're currently on version 2019. There's a small update version of 4.1.1 due out next week. Um, but basically this is an annual review of the uh, majority of products that we see in the SharePoint intranet in a box marketplace. So now if you don't know that, you see at the bottom left, there's a, uh, um, a URL, clearbox.co.uk for SP intranet. So what I want to go through with you today is a, a review of some of the trends that we've seen, both through the research we've done on the 2019 report and various changes that are happening both inside and outside the SharePoint world. And particularly the outside of the SharePoint world I think is interesting because sometimes uh, if you're in the Microsoft bubble, you don't really look over the wall at what's happening in, in the rest of the internet digital workplace industry, but there's some interesting stuff going on there. This webinar is a bit of an experiment for us really in terms of engaging more directly with the SharePoint industry. So I'm also really interested to get your feedback on whether you find this helpful and if you'd like to see Clearbox doing more of this kind of thing. So let me start with the inner box market trend side of things. So one of the bits of data that we gather for our SharePoint Internet in a Box report is how long have you been, um, how, when did your product first come to market? And you'll see the blue line tracks when people said we first launched our product and after about 2015, there's a, there's a really strong uptick in terms of the, the number of products that were out there. Um, the Clearbox report covers most of them, but not all. There's a little bit of extrapolation going on in these numbers in that we don't um, currently uh, report on 70 of them, but we know of quite a few names out there that are maybe quite niche. Or, um, and we also know some products that have been on the market that have gone away again. So. To the best of my knowledge, this line is, I guess, about 95% accurate. You'll notice over on the right, we've got a, a bit of a leveling off. Um, and as uh, we'll come on to, I think what we're going to see is a degree of consolidation, a degree of um, slowing down in terms of new products coming to the market, um, but also some real kind of um, firming up of the offers that are on there. Something else you might also be interested in is the, the size of clients that the inner box products serve. Now this is pertinent for us because when we've worked with large organizations, you know, like 50, 100,000 employees, four years or so ago, they, they, were, they were interested in the inner box space, but they were a little bit cautious. Nobody wanted to be the first really big test case. So I'm really pleased to see now that we have actually some, some very big use cases. Um, looks like Unily, according to the data we have, it is uh, taking the, the prize at the moment for the biggest in a box deployment that we know of. But there's about 14 out of the 31 products here that have deployed to organizations of 50,000 employees or more. And the great majority have got uh, case studies now of organizations where they deploy to 30,000 or more. So these are good, big, robust deployments. And I think that certainly addresses one of the early concerns that we saw in this space. Big news over the last 12 months, I guess, has been the, um, the mergers and acquisitions and consolidation side of things. So uh, probably most excitingly, um, Live Tiles acquired Wisdom uh, about uh, two months ago, I think it was. I guess uh, from my point of view, this largely seems to be about growing market share. So wisdom very strong in Europe, but not so strong in North America. Lifetile strong in the US, not so strong within Europe. Uh, my understanding is that both products will continue. I guess if I was going to put money on it, though, I would say that the appeal of the Lifetile's offer, 
has become somewhat less compelling now that the modern interface has come into play and it's much easier to to rearrange your web parts visually whereas wisdom's always been much more um, something that you install within SharePoint and using more um, routine web parts um, I've also noticed some of the marketing now is for example doing cross-selling so like um, wisdom promoting the uh, hyperfish product that's also owned by live tiles and uh, some of the bot propositions as well bonsai was an in another interesting one last summer so bonsai um, was acquired by esw capital but they were put under the brand of skyvera um, skyvera is interesting because uh, also under that uh, label is the old social side of citrion or newsgator if you remember newsgator newsgator is one of the first social tools that installed um, on top of SharePoint on-prem. So, but Bonsai wasn't that great, um, or didn't really stand out for the social side of what it did. Potential there then for the Newsgator Citroen functionality to, to be combined with Bonsai. And also extrapolating a bit further, ESW Capital um, owned Jive, uh, as well as um, .NET Nuke, by the way, but Jive, um, we see quite a lot of large organizations wanting to come off Jive now. So if they're looking at the Office 365 space, but wanting that kind of social capability, um, I'm gonna put those dots on a piece of paper and join them up. I don't know if uh, Skyver is doing the same, but I'm wondering if that's where it's going. Third example, Content and Code joined IT Lab, Content and Code, makers of the Fresh product. I think, um, it's a healthy sign for a much bigger organization like IT Lab to acquire content and code because often when we're doing procurement type studies with potential buyers, they're asking questions like what's the 24 seven support and what's the track record of this company. And if we commit to using their product, how do we know that they're still going to be in business in three to five years time? So there's some reassurance that comes from um, being aligned with a bigger parent company to provide this. Next, I wanted to talk a little bit about changes coming into the SharePoint space from Microsoft themselves. I don't need to tell you how uh, rapid the cadence is in terms of new releases. This chart is something um, that we put out in the 2019 report, but it, it's also public. So please do feel free to uh, find it on our website and point your prospects and customers to it as well. What I was trying to spell out in this chart was what is the role of an internet in a box compared to everything that SharePoint can do? Because I guess the message that potential buyers are hearing very strongly is that modern SharePoint does everything you need from an internet. So what's the value add of an in a box product? If you look at the orange lines, um, the overall message is that, you know, there, there are still a lot of gaps when it comes to the UX, particularly around things like multi-language, a lot of gaps around analytics and governance. This chart, um, when we do the new, new report update next week, um, things like this pale blue bar due to go dark blue because filtering and reordering of news has now gone live on the SharePoint roadmap. So Microsoft definitely eating away at some of this line, the clearer ground down here, um, if you are a vendor, then a bit of an appeal to you to, <laughs> to help us um, reinforce this kind of message because I think that there is a real risk now that um, people are, are going to try and bypass an in-a-box product uh, and don't necessarily understand that later on in their journey, they might run aground by doing things in native SharePoint and, and maybe finding it a little bit hard to, to reverse out of that position. So the question I get asked a lot these days is, once we've got communication and hub sites, does that give us an internet that we need? Right now, um, I think there's two big showstoppers. One is that you can't do the kind of global navigation that organizations have traditionally done with uh, corporate wide internet. So you would have to, for example, create a mega menu and have the one and only hub site sitting on top of every single other site that you create. And 
Um, there are 101 reasons why that would create an information architecture mess. The other big showstopper in many cases is the, the lack of multiple language support. If you saw the um, Ignite slides that Microsoft put out last year, they said that multiple languages was top of mind, which um, I take to mean a clue that this will be on their roadmap for 2019. Stand by to see what they announced there for at the SharePoint conference in Vegas. Um, incidentally, I'll be at the conference in May in Vegas. So uh, if you want to touch base, please do let me know and happily come and grab a coffee with you. Other things missing though, from the, the standard SharePoint offering, particularly I think the social experience has got a bit odd. Ever since Microsoft acquired Yammer just after launching the community's newsfeed features, it never really looped back and created a fully integrated social experience. Um, in particular, if you look at things like comments on news on community, sorry, communication sites, these are really quite separate from other social activities. You don't see this in, in non-SharePoint intranet. So if you go to my profile on something like uh, the Interact intranet product, you would see alongside me contributing to a community of practice or giving feedback to a blog post, also comments that have made on corporate news. So you would see kind of much more integrated news feed. And of course with Yammer, you're strictly in cloud and until we get a European cloud host of Yammer, which is promised for later this year, there's always gonna be some reservations about Yammer as a social tool anyway. The other thing I wanted to highlight that I still see as a gap with the, the Microsoft offering is the concept of a new center. If you talk to internal communicators a lot, as we do, um, what they really expect to see is a behind the scenes publishing area that they can go to, where they can see all of the news articles and then tags on those news articles that would say, these are the audiences that they've been sent out to. Now, I know audiences in a certain sense has just been released within communication sites and modern sites in SharePoint. But it, it seems to be that Microsoft come at it from the sense of saying, people will publish in 101 places, actually create the pages in 101 sites, and we'll give you tools to aggregate them into something more central. And that's the inverse of what I'm talking about here. I think uh, corporate communicators want to say, we'd like to publish centrally, and then push out along a number of channels, both sites, but also things like digital signage and into employee apps as well as things that they would like to do. What about trends that we've seen in the 2019 report then around in a box products? Well, we just done a video that came out this week where we tried to help people understand a little bit of the difference in the, the architectures. So if you go to playbox.co.uk slash four types, or I guess look at any of our social feeds, which we've been flooding with links to this little video, it's only 80 seconds long. We're saying that some of them are, are frameworks that are designed to accelerate the build. Some of them are more um, like applications that run alongside. Some of them genuinely are ready to run products that you can install in a matter of hours or, or certainly days. And some of them are more like code based accelerators where you, you do need quite deep SharePoint knowledge to pull them together. But also in terms of the, the trends we looked at, we, um, we picked out three things in the report and I've added a fourth one that were changes that we noticed between the 2018 and 2019 reports. So one of those is what we call light and lean. This is vendors whose strategy is to say, yeah, we see SharePoint getting more and more capabilities and we don't want to tread on its toes. So our product will make sure that it fits very neatly around the Microsoft offer. And if Microsoft release some functionality that duplicates ours, we'll pull our functionality. Now this is smart in the sense that it reassures buyers who don't want to feel like um, they're going to end up being painted into a corner with the product. Sometimes though, I think we should be a little bit bolder and say what Microsoft tends to do is broad but shallow in its functionality. And sometimes if you pull your own functionality, what Microsoft replaces it with actually isn't as good as something that was custom designed. Next on multiple languages, I was really pleased to see um, how many products have now 
thought through what you need for multiple language support. So this isn't just about translating the menus. It's really also about the, the workflow that goes behind saying, we want to publish a big announcement in five different languages at once. And if one of the um, things changes, like the English version changes, then we want to manage the workflow to make sure the child versions get translated into the other languages as well. Third one, Digital Workplace Hub Claims. So I hope it's not too sarcastic to put this in quotes, but <laughs> a lot of the marketing we're seeing around internet in the box products says that they are a digital workplace hub. And I get it, I see the appeal of pulling things together. What I would just caution about is, is overstating that because I do think if you're being sincere in terms of what a digital workplace really is, then it goes much broader than Office 365. And I'm not sure many products in the inner box space sincerely go way beyond Office 365. The last one isn't in the report, but it's something that I've seen more recently. I'm calling always on until I can come up with a better name. So there seems to be a trend to have intranet experiences that are not within browsers. So I guess end users getting used to having apps rather than going to a page and waiting for it to download and getting impatient with the pace at which they can click through intranet. So some vendors are starting to create desktop apps or fly out panels where that content is preloaded and it becomes much quicker, for example, to hop between forms and the people finder and the latest alert section. Um, I think this is great. It makes a lot of sense. It's interesting to see um, cloud services like Trello also creating Word and Mac applications, I think for the same reason that the more you want it to be a tool, the less satisfying the functional experiences if you've got a load of web page to do it. Now, sometimes people say to me, you've got these eight scenarios in the Internet in a Box report, Sam. How would SharePoint on its own score in these scenarios? The answer is zero on everything. Zero by definition, because our scenarios evaluate what the product adds over and above the standard SharePoint. Um, but I'm going to take that feedback on board and we'll change how we represent the scores in the next version of the report. So people can see that um, a little bit like that roadmap I showed you, there are some areas that SharePoint's natively quite strong at and other areas where it's not so good. So each of these eight icons represents the scenarios like news publishing, user experience and so on. And in the report, we score them out of five. What you see is the numbers in the circles are the averages across the 39 products that we scored out of five. So you can see as you might expect, news pretty good, user experience is okay. Search, um, scoring two out of five, not great. But uh, of course, uh, again in Vegas, we're expecting to hear more from SharePoint about search. So I can understand why some products weren't pushing forward on that one. I think there's more opportunity to do big things with analytics, so because analytics scored badly. And yes, you can say Google Analytics, but Google Analytics is much more web mindset than internet mindset. So it doesn't necessarily give internet owners the kind of dashboard that they're looking for. And also what they're looking for from analytics are governance analytics. So understanding when content expired understanding when a page owner has left the company. Those two are not well supported from web-oriented analytics tools. For those products that use Power BI, uh, makes a lot of sense. Love it as a, as a kind of way of integrating Office 365. But we didn't score it very highly unless the Power BI report came ready-made, understanding what internet managers are looking for. And I think you know, if you're saying it's an internet in a box, then it should be analytics in a box to go with it rather than saying you can uh, brew your own because it's Power BI. Employee services are a little bit similar. So for products pitched at very large organizations, absolutely wouldn't expect um, them to go into this space because they've got Workday and service now, that's fine. But for those products which are pitched at small to medium enterprises, I think, again, there's an opportunity to do some smart things with Flow and Power Apps to, to give a more ready-made, like a employee services in a box type experience. 
And lastly, uh, uh, let me pick out integration. So most products integrate very nicely with the rest of Office 365. But I just want to remind you that if you kind of put your employee in the middle of this chart, only about half of an employee's digital workplace world is actually in the Office 365 sphere. So it's really important that we think about how do we integrate outside of Office 365 with all the other tools that they use. For example, Salesforce, you know, if I go into my intranet and I search for the name of a client, wouldn't it be great if the CRM record from Salesforce was pulled up if that client's raised lots of ServiceNow tickets that those are also appearing. And what this does, as you can see from the David Hansen quote, is by aggregating it, we can then manage the interruption, we can manage the notifications around it. What about the non-SharePoint world? Well, there's probably you know, about 150 internet products that are built on other CMSs uh, and other technology architectures and if you look at some of these they're very strong on news as you might expect some of them have a their own document collaboration or certainly kind of like document publishing thing but as they describe they do a lot more around the social side in a way which i think is a lot more elegant than on the office 365 stack they have analytics built in uh, along the lines that i just described of really saying what does the dashboard for an internal communicator look like? What does a dashboard for someone in charge of in internet governance look like? And some of them come with a lot of employee services built in. The little icons that I'm showing here are a collage or screenshots from Bitrix 24. Um, pick Bitrix at random, but um, one of the things that makes it stand out is that for just $200 a month, you get all of this for an unlimited number of users. So cost, if you look outside the, the SharePoint world, is also quite a factor. And as I was saying about employee services, so uh, sticking with the Bitrix example, Bitrix has a whole kind of uh, HR services thing built in there for, for time reporting, absences, meetings, and a whole workflow management tool. If you're on the Office 365 side of the fence, um, you probably think, oh, we can do all that with Power Apps and Flow. And my response is, yes, great, but let's do it. You know, let's um, market the inner box products as having ready-made absence charts and ready-made work reports that might be configured with Power Apps, but just recognizing that a, a lot of particularly SME buyers don't have the time or skills in-house to create these things, even though they're technically possible. What we're starting to see as well is vendors who are outside of Office 365 recognizing that a lot of their clients are moving to it because they want the exchange side of things and um, maybe the, the Azure hosting and, and things like Yammer. And therefore moving their products so that they wrap around them much more closely. Even down to things like a, an integrated search, so not side by side search results, but actually indexing both Office 365 and their own internet content in one. So on the right, you can see uh, Interact, who basically say, you know, um, saying, well, you know, our product is like an internet in a box, Sam, um, product for, for SharePoint now, Sam, so can we be in the report? Or over here, Lumaps, who started more at the kind of the mobile side of things, also doing a lot to play nicely um, with Office 365. The, the downside of this is that you do sometimes get feature duplication. So although something like Interact works nicely with Yammer, as I described, it also has that full kind of social feature set built in. The other one to look over your shoulder for is the employee apps marketplace. So on the comm side, Dynamic Signal and Social Chorus, they've really come about because uh, comms folk uh, I think I've got a bit fed up of waiting for IT to catch up. You know, it used to be that IT wouldn't give a lot of attention to requests to improve intranet functionality. Now some comm teams have been told you've got to wait a year because we're in the midst of a big Office 365 migration. So comms have said, rough, never mind that. We'll get out the credit card, we'll subscribe to Dynamic Signal. Three weeks later, we're up and running. This is great, it's so flexible. It's so much more like we have for our web publishing tools. All of that is great, all that is true. 
downside is that it then creates kind of information silos. What's happening then is that companies like Dynamic Signal are uh, cottoning onto this and starting to play nice again so that comms can say to IT, don't worry about it. In a year's time, when you've got SharePoint online up and running, Dynamic Signal will push all of our news stories into a SharePoint list, it'll be indexed again. We won't have that, um, uh, that silo type approach. Also, as you can see on the left, Dynamic Signal really good at doing that comms driven analytics dashboard completely baked in to the product. The other side to employee apps, which uh, I find really interesting, is integration of services. So on the left, there's a product called WorkGrid. WorkGrid is a spin off from the internet team, uh, the in house internet team at Liberty Mutual. If you haven't seen Liberty Mutual's case study, I really encourage you to go and have a look. It won a whole bunch of prizes from like Step 2 and Nielsen Norman Group last year. But what we're looking at is a mobile app where alerts from lots of different systems are integrated using microservices. And crucially, you can actually interact with those alerts. You can approve things, you can review them from within the employee app. You don't have to go into uh, like a, a dedicated um, service now app in order to do things. Citrix uh, acquired Sappho last year. Sappho, very similar, also works within um, Microsoft Teams, so that kind of uh, um, always on experience available once you bought Sappho. And the last thing that I'll notice is um, I think we're moving towards something which is more like a headless CMS. So what I mean is content residing quite possibly in SharePoint, but also maybe in other content management systems like Drupal and Sitecore. And then what's really appealing is the ability to aggregate this and push it out selectively through the right channels as well. So you might say, here's a big news story. We'll definitely put it on the um, comm site but also we want to push it out through the employee app. And for some of these employees, it should actually appear as a lock screen alert. We know some people would rather have it in Teams so we can do that. And also we want people to discuss it. So if you've got something like Workplace by Facebook as a social channel, then we can pump it out there as well. Really powerful if you know the common identity of people across those different systems. So you can say, we engaged with 80% of people within finance, and most of those in finance went through it, to it through, say, workplace, whereas most people in IT went to it through Teams. So you start to get some kind of channel data coming back through. So last slide, as I've got an eye on the clock, and uh, we'll do Q&A in extra time. I'm happy to stay on. In summary, the trends that I see, um, I'm sure we'll see case studies sponsored a lot by Microsoft saying, we built our entire corporate internet using plain SharePoint. I think some internet in a box vendors are finding it a big challenge to move over to modern. And if I was in their shoes, I'd probably make the decision to partner with one of the bigger players, like, you know, and become a reseller because they've got the critical mass to make updates um, and keep in step with Microsoft soft. I've had quite a few venture capitalists getting in touch, wanting advice. I'm sure there's more merge and acquisitions to come. If you're focusing on the SME world, then I would say think more about the workflow and employee services. And if you're focusing on the bigger side of things and think about a headless CMS type mindset. So we will be doing a new SharePoint report uh, starting research in June. If you haven't heard from us yet, don't worry, it's coming and that will be out in November, uh, the 2020 edition. I expect we'll have fewer in-depth reviews and more short reviews. But what we're looking into is moving more towards a quarterly release model. So if you don't get in the, the November launch in the next quarter, maybe it'd be better timing for you anyway to be in that one. We're also looking into a non-SharePoint internet report, so looking at the, uh, the competition outside the Microsoft world. One of the things I'd really like to do is ask each vendor to give Clearbox evaluators a sandbox environment so we can go in there and um, actually see what it's like to be a publisher. Again, I'd be very welcome, uh, uh, really welcome any feedback about how you'd feel about us doing that. I'm going to be in Vegas. So again, there's the details, there's a discount code. Please do get in touch. But otherwise, I'm open to Q&A. And I think we've got one from Mark. So uh, let me just have a look at that one.
So if you've got any questions, please do type them into your Q&A box. Um, Mark says, great analysis. Do you think that soon the big value improvements like voice recognition, real-time translation of voice can be delivered by companies with budgets that are maximum can afford third-party vendors will get squeezed out? No, I think, Mark, um, the voice recognition, real-time translation is going to be a web service that some of the vendors will tap into. So we already see it with multilingual intranets. Um, where a lot of the workflow sends the, the English text off to Bing Translate, and then it comes back in, say, German as a rough draft, and the best ones will put the English and German drafts side by side. So using web services like this, um, already done, again, also for cognitive services, where there might be, for example, using um, image recognition to do classification and then tagging that as metadata in a SharePoint list column. Uh, Simon Hudson, um, also interested in the next wave voice mobile first. What's the market design readiness for that? Ha! Uh, mobile first, definitely. You know, uh, that's been around a long time. Uh, and I think that's why the employee apps element is there. Voice, I think, is a much slower burner. Uh, I would wait to see how things like um, Alexa for Business takes off. The thing about voice is that it's so disruptive and everybody's gone through the open plan so although it sounds good it's i'm not sure it, it, the, the use cases of scene for voice are, are so compelling there are niches um truck drivers lab technicians who've got their uh, their eyes occupied looking down the microscope for doing instructions and so on absolutely but it often the inner box market is, it tends to be the all employee rather than niche employee Intelligent intranets, I mean, I mean, <laughs> you tell me what intelligent intranets means. I was just running a focus group and the message loud and clear is that intelligent intranets for people who are caterers and housekeepers and nurses and that kind of thing, all they want is something that is smart enough to filter through the emails that they get or to prioritize news on an intranet saying, if this is your role, this is what you should see. And I don't think I've seen that intelligence uh, yet reliably enough. So it's not just subscribing to things. It's about saying, show me less of this, show me less stuff coming out of corporate and show me more of this, show me more things coming from my expert community. So not off and on, but maybe just kind of promoting or demoting. Um, I think techn technologically it's possible. Uh, a lot of it's about trust. But yeah, um, most of the companies we deal with, they've got a way to go. Uh, Simon commented, small part, uh, LX for business, small part of the US. Um, no timeline for introduction into the UK. Yeah, it's been out in the US, I think, for about a year. So the fact that it hasn't um, rolled out really quickly makes me think that they are still working on use cases. I had a look at the Alexa site earlier this week. And there's, there's only a couple of vendors and uh, it's like um, saying to Concur, when's, where's my next flight? So it's still very consumer-like. Um, starting and ending meetings, it's a nice to have. It's not, it's not mainstream. So I'm over time. Thank you for your patience. Thank you everybody who tuned in. Uh, final reminder, please, yeah, do give us feedback about this session. Do let me know if you're gonna be in Vegas. Do give me feedback. Uh, about any thoughts you have about the next version of our report. Once I'm back from Vegas in June, I'm sure head swimming with new ideas about what Microsoft's doing, then we'll get cracking with thinking about the uh, scenarios and the approach we'll take to the next version of the report. Thanks again, everybody, and have a good day. <laughs>